hadn't heard yet. Tuition's going up next year. For incoming students. It's for everybody. So, surprise, surprise. Also, notice, I think that that's a bonus opportunity, isn't it? Yeah. Somebody asked me if they could volunteer to work at the blood drive if they're not able to give blood. That'd be great. I'd call that a bonus opportunity, too. So there's lots of ways to earn a bonus on that. So <coughs> now you can't be in a clinical research trial. That I won't let you do. Sorry, I have to draw the line somewhere. All right, a couple questions have come up that um, have caused people. Uh, there we go. There, thank you. Uh, anxiety, questions, they don't know what's going on. They think I do. I know, I heard that. First of all, with regard to Professor Bader and Professor Hoffman's seminars, yes, those are testable material. So what I would suggest that you do is if that if you have not viewed the seminars yet, that you do. And they are available on MediaVision. There's Professor Bader from yesterday. There's Professor Roald Hoffman, not Ronald Hoffman, from last Thursday. If you haven't watched them yet, you should watch them. I will be watching them this weekend as well because yesterday's, for example, was a very intense seminar. Um, it, it was funny. He was quite a character. Um, and that is his natural persona. Um, he's a funny, he likes to laugh at himself. Um, but what I'm going to do this weekend is I will sit and watch both seminars a second time. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and Monday we will talk about the things that I think you should focus on regarding those two seminars. Because there was some good stuff in there. Um, some things that I think you can understand. And yes, some of it went sailing over everybody's head. Um, don't worry too much about what went over your head. Try and pick on those things that made sense, that you could equate to something we've talked about. Um, I have intentionally, this semester or this year, avoided the topic of quantum mechanics, mechanics because it's really a frightening subject. Quantum mechanics, if you ask Amelia, is lots of fun. She loves it. But quantum mechanics at this level, I don't know that I agree with the one thing Professor Bader said, insisted at the end of the hour. Let's bring quantum mechanics back into high school chemistry. That's a bunch of, you've got to be able to understand what an integral is before you can do quantum mechanics. You can understand some of the basics of quantum mechanics, which simply say that we can predict where electrons are, we can predict how fast they're moving, but we can't do both at the same time. And you sit there and say, huh? And that's perfectly normal. There are some people, there are lots of quotes that go around that say things like, if you're not deathly afraid of quantum mechanics, you don't understand it. Things like, if you understand quantum mechanics, you obviously haven't studied it. Uh, quantum mechanics is not trivial. But if you step back and look at it, as Professor Bader was insisting yesterday, and I agree with him on, it can answer a lot of questions. Although I loved his jab, and several of you got it yesterday, about the quantum theoretician who's been solving the H2 molecule ion problem for 30 years. I think I've told you there's five answers that physical chemists can answer. And one of them is, what is the energy of a H2 molecule ion? So what? It's got one electron. As soon as you add a second electron, you complicate things. What he was trying to show you yesterday is it's really not that complicated in his mind. Um, was what he was saying true? I don't know. Was that what Dr. Hoffman was saying true? I don't know. One of the beauties of, of this discipline is we don't necessarily know this is the answer. We know this is a possible answer. Um, and so there is very few right and wrong. So, do look at these this weekend. We'll talk about it on Monday so you have some guidance for Thursday. Second, you have an exam, an opportunity, a test, a quiz, whatever you want to call it. Next Thursday, I will post to Blackboard over the weekend where your rooms are 
Uh, there's only three this time, this room, CLAP 108 and DeGrace 312. So you've got about a 40% chance of being in this room, a 30% chance of being in CLAP and a 30% chance of being in DeGrace. No, I'm not making accommodations for lab this time because they're all within walking distance of this place. So um, we'll, we'll just divide it up by the alphabet. Uh, the exams during the provost hour, you'll have an hour. Uh, the challenge, and I understand that this is causing some anxiety for many of you, is that there will be very few calculations on this test. This will be one, and I did find a new topic besides maple syrup, where's Shane, uh, to talk about. It, and it is a single topic this time again. Um, I, I, I was quite pleased with it when I opened my refrigerator and said, that's it! So open your refrigerator and you might be able to figure out what it is. Um, I'm not, I am not going to answer that question this time. So, although milk would be great, it could do ice cream, I could do ice milk, ooh, there'd be lots of things I could do. Cream, milk, sour cream, cottage cheese, oh, there's lots of things. I'll have to save that one, that might be good. <laughs> all right, so your challenge on this next test will be, all right, let's take these simple concepts that we've been talking about and apply them to a new situation. Yes, that is somewhat disconcerting to think you're going to have to do that, but my job is to make sure you can. So hopefully you'll be able to, I think you will. Um, the other thing is, it will be a lot of writing. So come prepared to write. Um, I don't think it will be an unmanageable amount of writing, but remember we have to grade that too, so we wanna make sure it's not so much writing that we can't grade it. Okay, the other source of anxiety, of course, is the paper. What I intend to do is that by the Monday after the test, I wanna get you through this test, um, I will have for you posted to Blackboard a very clear expectation of what is the paper, what is the timeline, what is the grading rubric, who will be doing what, um, and those kind of things, so that you have structure to base this on. Right now, hopefully all you're doing is dreaming up ideas of things you'd like to write about. Um, you're hopefully talking with other people, saying, hey, you wanna be part of my group. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all to find out there's a group of 30 that's gonna divide into 10 groups of three. I'd rather you didn't do that, but I know that it's okay for you to talk with anybody you want about this paper. Ultimately, it's three people's name, three to five people's names on the front page of this paper. That's what your objective is. Several people have said, I don't know who to work with. So we will start a discussion on Blackboard uh, that says, hey, here's the topic that I wanna discuss, I wanna research, or I wanna talk about, I wanna write about, is anybody else interested? Here's my email, contact me. So we're gonna play matchmaker on Blackboard. Um, if you would like to find a partner, you can look up there. If you would like to be a partner, you can post it up there. So I'll start that discussion board sometime this weekend Feel free to jump in at any time. Uh, one of your tutors, um, if you haven't met Josh yet, Josh has been lamenting the fact that you guys don't use the discussion board as much as we did last year. Um, last year there was all kinds of ongoing dialogue and it was mainly because I would start after every test, I'd go to my office and I'd put a little note up there saying, so how bad was it? And the first one, it took a while, but eventually people started to throw out comments that they really thought about the test. Then they said, hey, wait, we could do this before the test. I don't understand how to do this kind of problem. Can someone help me? And so once we started those dialogues, what happened was your classmates answered your questions. I didn't have to. Um, and so it is an effective tool because the, the SIs monitor it, I monitor it, your classmates monitor it. So if you ever have a question about something that doesn't make sense, Dr. Kenny said this, and he's full of you know what, can somebody make, explain it to me? People will get out there and explain it to you. Also realize that I do not take anything you write up there in a way that's going to affect your grade. If you think that I screwed something up, say I screwed it up and ask me to explain it. If you think that something was done that didn't make sense and someone else in here might be able to explain it to you, ask them to do that. The give and take you get, your classmates are probably your best helpers in all of these things. So. I'm working on it. They showed me how to do it and I've forgotten. 
Yes, I plan to put a link on the Blackboard site to Media Vision and to Kappa for that matter. Oh yes, Kappa is back. I'm uploading all your usernames now as we speak, so um, I will get that up and running after the first test. So this first test um, is really gonna be take some of these simple concepts and apply them in new situations. Yes, it's intended to stress you a little bit. So I think I'm successful at the moment. Um, hopefully not overly so. Amelia says, they don't know what to expect. Believe me, go to the SIs and ask them, and, and they're very good at forecasting the things that I'm gonna get. They don't always get it right. So don't think that they get it completely right because they don't see the test in advance either. All right, any questions before I uh, move on to other things? All right, let's get rid of some things. I didn't bring my computer down with me. I'm busy typing other stuff on it, so. Thank you. <coughs> Back to what we were ending with the other, yes, Wednesday. Talking about the rates of chemical reactions. How fast do they occur? And to be able to forecast these, let's do it Q and R. So we've got some generic equation, A plus B to give me Q and R as products. And if I do a, a time plot of some measure of amount, whether that be concentration if we're talking about a liquid compound, of pressure if we're talking about uh, a gas, it could be number of moles or mass. You can plot any kind of unit on the vertical axis that is, a, is related to amount that you want. Eventually, they're all going to boil back to number of moles because we're really looking, all chemical reactions happen on a mole per mole basis. And so reaction rates are based ultimately on moles, but you're gonna see different units over here. And over here, you've got time. The standard reaction that is shown is if you take two NO2 molecules and you combine them together, you get one N2O4 molecule. And so if I start with a mixture that is just NO2 molecules, some amount, I get a curve that looks something like this. And if there is no N2O4 initially, Let's see, for every two of these, I get one of these. It grows at a rate very similar, but at half the rate. So you've got one of them being used up. There's a negative slope at any point in time. If I draw a tangent to the curve at any point on that curve, it's a negative slope for N2O4. If I draw a tangent to the curve at the same time for NO2, it's a positive slope. And if you related the two of them together, this, the, the um, excuse me, I did that backwards. The negative slope is for what's being used up. <coughs> the positive slope is what, for what's being produced. And the ratio of those two slopes is in the, in the same ratio as the stoichiometric coefficient. So you're using up NO2 twice as fast as you're producing N2O4. That will be true for any chemical reaction. What if I start the reaction with a little bit of both? Well, if you start the reaction with a little bit of both, I'll still use up the NO2 and I'll still make N2O4. The same re relationship is going to hold true. The slope at any instant in time for one is positive, one is negative, and they're in a ratio of two to one. Doesn't matter if I start with some or none, it will still give me the same result. And what 
people found is that you could take the rate of that reaction and you could write a rate law that says that the rate of that reaction at some instant in time is equal to some constant to be determined times the concentration of NO2 raised to the second power. Well, that looks reasonable. That's what the equation tells me. And whether that rate is the change in the concentration of NO2 with respect to time or the change in the concentration of N2O4 with respect to time doesn't matter. Now remember, these have to be related to each other by one of them is getting used up, the other one is being produced, and I'm able to make those in equality for every one of these that I lose, I use up two of those. So we're going to get a relationship. Yes? The really sucky thing about kinetic rate laws, that's called the rate law. The rate law expression is simply that equation that says the rate of a reaction is equal to some constant time, some concentration raised to some power. The, anytime you see an equation like that, it's called a rate law expression. The really disgusting thing about kinetics is you can't look at the balanced equation and figure out what the rate law is. There's no relationship between the rate law expression and the balanced chemical equation. Absolutely none. That's what makes it disgusting, but it is also what makes it fun. For example, a nice simple reaction that we'll talk quite a bit about is that one, the production of ammonia. And as I told you, I think, previously, this simple reaction won the Nobel Prize for the third time this past year. Someone received a Nobel Prize because they studied that reaction. And you'd think, wow, you're kidding me. That simple thing, we, we can balance that. We can do stoichiometry with that reaction. It's an extremely important reaction because ammonia is needed to grow crops. You need fertilizer. That's what ammonia is used for. And so the first Nobel Prize was given, as I think I shared with you, for figuring out I could take nitrogen and hydrogen and make ammonia. The second Nobel Prize was given because the guy figured out, how do I get lots of ammonia? So you got to know that, and that was a couple years apart. This third one, 50 years later, finally gets the Nobel Prize because he said, and here's why it works. The kinetics of this process, it ends up, is seven steps long. There are seven steps that goes into making this process work. And no one knew what they were until Gerhard Ertl came along and figured it out, and figured out how each step behaved. And the experiments that he did were so elegant and yet so simple that he was rewarded for that with the Nobel Prize. What we're going to try and figure out is how do you figure out the rate law expression for a simple reaction that actually takes place over more than one step. Now let me throw one little twist in here. I told you that there is no relationship between the rate law expression and the balanced chemical equation. However, if I list all the steps in a mechanism, and a mechanism is simply a series of steps that add together to give me the total reaction. If I list all the steps in any given reaction, I can write a rate law expression for each and every step 
that is based on the balanced equation. Let me try that again. The rate law expression, the mathematical equation, is not related to the balanced chemical equation except the rate law expression for each step of a mechanism is related to the balanced chemical equation for each step. Those appear to be contradictory statements, and in some respects they are. What it's telling you is that that reaction over there, nitrogen plus three hydrogen to form two ammonia, if you think about this on an atomic level scale, what that equation is telling you, I mean stoichiometry is easy. If I give you uh, 28 grams of nitrogen and I give you two, four, six, six grams of ammonia, excuse me, of hydrogen, you all would say, okay, 28 grams of nitrogen, that's one mole. Six grams of ammonia, that's three moles. I'm gonna react them together and I'm gonna make two moles of ammonia, 34 grams of ammonia. Okay, you can all do that. But think about what's happening on an atomic level. You got a nitrogen molecule and you got three hydrogen molecules and in order to get them to react to form ammonia, just draw the dot picture and think about it. I've got to bring these things together and I've got to break a nitrogen and nitrogen triple bond, which has a bond energy of about 950 kilojoules per mole. It's huge. It's one of the strongest bonds we know of, if not the strongest. I've got to break three hydrogen hydrogen bonds and then I have to make six nitrogen hydrogen bonds. And I have to do it in such a way so that I start with Three, four linear molecules, N2, H2, 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 and I end up with two trigonal pyramidal molecules, ammonia, and so you slam these all together, and somehow they arrange themselves just so to break all those bonds and arrange themselves properly. You think that happens that way? Uh-uh. Very, very few chemical reactions are as simple as Let's take a nitrogen and three hydrogen and put them in the same place at the same time and they have the right orientation and therefore I get ammonia. But that's what chemical reactions have to do to happen. You have to get all the pieces in the same place in the same time with the right orientation and I don't even know what the right orientation is to make the product. If a reaction happened in one step, that's what it would be. 
if the reaction happened in one step, then you could say the rate law expression for a one step mechanism is exactly related to the balanced chemical equation for that step. For any one step chemical mechanism, you can look at the balanced equation and say the rate law for that reaction is rate of production of ammonia is equal to the concentration of nitrogen raised to the first times the concentration of hydrogen raised to the third. But getting four things in one place at one time, just try getting four of your friends in the same place at the same time with one car to get to where you want to go. How hard is that? It's much easier to say, all right, Mustafa, you pick me up over here. Susie, I'll meet you over there, and we'll get together at this place. There's a three-step mechanism just so you can get in one car to go bowling. Chemical reactions are exactly the same way. We're going to start by taking nitrogen, and we're going to adhere it to a chemical surface. And as soon as we get it absorbed on the chemical surface, then we're going to bring in some hydrogen, and we're going to get it to stick to the chemical surface. And after they've both stuck to the chemical surface, we're going to let the bonds break. So now I have nitrogen atoms and hydrogen atoms. And now that the bonds have broken, I've got this nitrogen atom here. And oh, look, there's three hydrogen atoms that are moving around nicely. They happen to be in the right place at the right time. And they're in the right orientation. Hey, let's have a little party. So they get together, they stick, and then they fall off. You've just now made one ammonia. And you do that over and over, and you take all these steps and for each step along the way, we can write a rate law expression. What we're going to do for the next couple of minutes is we're going to look at simple reactions and first try to figure out how do you get the rate law. And then Monday, we'll talk about how do you get the mechanism. The hard part is the mechanism. The creative part is the mechanism. The part you're going to do on the exam on Thursday is the mechanism. You get to propose a mechanism for how it works. And think like an atom for a second. Think like you're trying to plan a party. If you want to get from here to there, is it easier to do it with two things, two people, or 37 of them? It's a heck of a lot easier to say, let's both go there, than it is to get all 37 to the same place at the same time. Chemical reactions are exactly the same thing. They like to have as few participants as possible. They work much better that way. Keep that in mind, and this stuff is really not bad. So here's what I'm going to give you. Here's a, a set of experimental data, OK? Fluorine reacts with ClO2 to make F FClO2. F2 plus goes to form 2FClO2. Nice, simple reaction. Here's the data. Concentration of fluorine, concentration of ClO2, Initial rate. So here's my data table in my lab booklet, because we all do good lab notebook stuff, right? When we remember to bring our lab book to lab. Boy, I need new glasses. All right. I do an experiment, experiment number one, with a tenth of a tenth molar fluorine, 0 0.010 molar ClO2, and I measure the rate of the reaction, however I do that, I'm not going to worry about how, I just know I'm going to, as being 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3. Could I rate a rate law expression from that? No, I can't. It's just one experiment. I might be able to say, OK, let's guess how is the, I know the rate is equal to K times concentration of this times concentration of that. They're raised to some stoichiometric power. I could sit and guess it. There's an easier way. Let's just do a second experiment. And because we are all good with our scientific method, it's a well-designed experiment, which means how many variables change? One. In a well-designed experiment, only one variable changes. So 
I'm going to do the experiment again. And guess what? I'm going to leave the concentration of fluorine the same. Instead, I'm going to multiply the concentration, or do the experiment with four times as much ClO2. And now I find out that the rate of this reaction is 4.8 times 10 to the minus 3. Yes? What is the unit of the rate? Hmm, good question. Let's see. It's the change in concentration divided by change in time. So the change in concentration would have, concentration would have units of moles per liter, or whatever units they might be, divided by time, seconds. So the units on this are moles per liter per second, or molarity per second. It might be atmospheres per second, it might be something else. But in this case, it's change in concentration divided by change in time. That's why I started with these graphs. And why I showed you that the rate at any given time is just the tangent to the curve. It's the slope. It's the change in the concentration of the y-axis, or the change in the y-axis divided by the change in the x-axis. Rates will always be that. Over here it said initial rate. Why did they say initial rate? Because the rate changes as a function of time. The rate when it first starts, its initial rate, is its greatest rate. And then it slows down. That's what we're getting to. All chemical reactions reach a state of equilibrium. And so if I measure the rate at time t equals 5 seconds, that's OK as long as I always measure the rate five seconds after I start the reaction. The nice thing about these reaction rates is as long as you're consistent, as long as you have a well-designed experiment, I could do this right after it starts reacting, five seconds after, ten seconds after, as long as I'm consistent. The other thing is chemical reactions take place on a scale of 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So when you measure the rates of some chemical reactions, you've got to be able to measure times in the femtosecond regime. And so the Nobel Prize in Chemistry a couple years ago was given to Ahmed Zawail because he figured out how to use lasers to measure time increments on the femtosecond time scale. That's nothing, but that's how quick individual chemical reactions occur. What we're talking about here is we're doing this in a bulk system, so we're mixing two liquids together perhaps, or two gases at room temperature, and we're not worrying about individual molecules reacting, we're worrying about the whole system reacting. And there's an average in there, but it's built in, so it's okay. All right, when I multiplied the concentration of ClO2 by 4, how much did the, the rate go up? By 4. So therefore, what if I multiply the concentration of ClO2 by 86? How much would the rate go up? 86. This is called a first order reaction because when we start to write the ra rate law for this now, we now know that if we raise the concentration of ClO2 to the first power, we'll understand how the rate is affected. So it's a first order reaction, it's raised to the first power. That's all order of a reaction means. All right, we gotta do another experiment. How did we know it was first order? Because when I changed the concentration by a factor of four, the rate changed by a factor of four. So over here, if you want to do it mathematically, I can write the ratio of the two rate reaction, rate law expressions. 
the rate of experiment two is equal to some constant k times the concentration of ClO2 in experiment two raised to the x power, I don't know what x is, divided by the rate of experiment one is equal to some constant k times the concentration of ClO2 raised to, in experiment one, raised to that same power. Well, you can simplify this, right? To be that. Algebraically, that's the same thing. And I can solve for x. And I can do this one by inspection. If this is four times this, and this is four times this, four raised to what power equals four? Well, you can all do that one. What if you can't do it by inspection? Oh, I gotta remember natural log functions now. The natural log of, x t or of a to the b is equal to b times the natural log of a. Oh, yuck, we gotta remember that? Hopefully not. Hopefully you'll be able to do these by inspection or by guessing. But if you want algebraically, if you just take the natural log of both sides of this equation, then I would find out that the natural log of rate two over rate one equals x times the natural log of ClO2. Yes, some of that algebra and trigonometry and calculus does come in handy every once in a while. So that's just an identity of natural log, okay? Hopefully I won't do that to you. I have been known to do it, but I'll try not to. All right, this one now, we said, all right, let's double the concentration of F2. And let's go back to a 0 0.01 molar solution of ClO2, just like the first experiment. And when I do this, I find out that the rate is 2.4 times 10 to the minus three. Am I going to compare the data of experiment two with experiment three? You could, but I don't advise it. Why? Because both concentrations are changing. It's not a well-designed experiment. This is a freshman college student designed experiment. I'm just kidding. Picking on you. You want only one variable. It ends up that when you're given a data table like this one that I'm stealing from your book, you can combine any of these you want. Compare these two because this stays constant and this changes, only one thing's changing. Compare this one with this one because now we're doubling the concentration of fluorine. This isn't changing, so it's not gonna affect the rate. When I double the concentration of fluorine, what happened to the rate? It doubled. So therefore, what is the order of the reaction with respect to fluorine? One again. What would it look like if it was second order with respect to fluorine? So it would be the formation of so many different It would go up by a factor of four. Whoa, where'd that come from? I'm gonna change the numbers. Okay, let's leave that for a second. We'll finish this out. Because now we can finish our rate law expression by adding in the fluorine. So here's the rate law for that reaction with that data. Now, if I change the reaction and this set of data actually came out to be 4.8 times 10 to the minus three, not 2.4 times 10 to the minus three, then when I doubled the concentration of fluorine, the rate went up by a factor of four, doubling the concentration, two to what power equals four? The power is the order of the reaction, the answer is two. Try this. Everybody okay with that? What if the data had looked like this? Now we're gonna triple that reaction.
And now I find out the rate is 10.8 times 10 to the minus 3, or it would probably be written 1.08 times 10 to the minus 2. Now what have you got? When you tripled the concentration, what happened to the rate? This one, it's not as obvious what happened to it because that's not a division that you can necessarily do in your head. 10.8, or 10, yeah, 10.8 divided by 1.2? Nine, oh good. It's nine times as much, I did my math right. So now when we tripled the concentration, we went up by a factor of nine, so therefore three to what power equals nine? Thank you very much. It's a second order reaction still. I'll give you a little hint about orders of reaction. Chemicals like chemists are simple. We like small numbers. Once you get past three, forget it. All bets are off. Because think about what we were saying with nitrogen plus three hydrogen to make two ammonia. What this rate law is now saying is that in order to get this reaction to occur, we have to devise a mechanism that allows us to get one ClO2 close to one F2 at the same time with the right orientation to get the reaction to occur. There's probably other steps in the process, but that's the one that matters. As you increase the order, you increase the complexity of how many things have to be in the same place at the same time with the right orientation. I'll keep saying that phrase till it's ingrained in your head. For a chemical reaction to occur, the participants in the reaction have to be in the right place at the right time with the right orientation. If any one of those three things is missing, it will not react. So that rate law tells us we need a fluorine molecule and a ClO2 molecule to be in the right place at the right time with the right orientation. And if that happens, we're likely to get a reaction. There's still no guarantee but it, we're likely to get one. But look at the balanced equation. The balanced equation says fluorine plus two ClO2 gives me products. That e balanced equation implies that you need one fluorine and two ClO2 to get this to react. Chemical reactions rarely ever work the way they're written balance-wise. There's le several steps along the way. So, just a second, Mary. The Rates, or the rate laws, excuse me, the orders of reaction, thank you, the orders of reaction that are most likely are zero, one, and two. When you write rate law expressions, you're most likely to get a power of concentration of some compound to the zero power, to the first power, or to the second power. What does it mean if it's to the zero power? It doesn't help the reaction or hurt it. It's not an issue in the overall rate of the reaction. So in a, if one reaction, the other reaction could be like vacuum vacuum problems? You know how much I like limiting vacuum problems. <laughs> the nice thing about rate law expressions is that all of a sudden limiting reaction problems don't make any sense anymore. The, I heard that, Emma. The reason why they don't make sense anymore is because the rate, how fast the reaction occurs, is, only, is dependent upon how high a concentration you've got. So as long as there's some of it there, then this curve, this slope, where did it disappear to? will still have shape to it. As soon as you run out of something, then the curve goes to zero and the reaction stops. There's a difference between the curve going to a value of zero and the curve leveling off, a slope of zero. A slope of zero means that the forward reaction and the reverse reaction are happening at the same rate. If that curve goes all the way to a value of zero of concentration, that means you ran out of something. And so limiting reactant problems stop making sense when we start talking about equilibrium. Now, that doesn't mean they won't come back to haunt you. 
when we do buffers, the reason why I have been saying limiting reactant, limiting reactant, limiting reactant, is because the way we approach a buffer problem is both from a limiting reactant perspective and an equilibrium perspective. Have a great weekend. I will see you on Monday.